is where the race is going to be won or lost. And, and there's the five just, car. Kyle Larson going a lap down. He's in trouble. You guys are really starting to slip and slide around. They're all over the place, folks. That is the right front tire. That is the rubber is gone. It is down to the canvas right there on the right front tire. Let's take a look at this right rear as well. Oh, we're not done yet. Welcome to another edition of NASCAR Inside the Race presented by Consumer Cellular. I'm Larry McReynolds sitting in for Steve Letarte alongside Championship Crew Chief Todd Gordon. Todd, race number five, Bristol in the books. Before Phoenix, we said, where's the Toyotas? I think we found them. I think we found Joe Gibbs racing this time, leading 383 of 500 laps. Yeah, definitely a dominant performance. And at one point for a good part of the race there, one, two, three, four, yeah. uh, you know, ran there. Not without controversy that rolled out during the day. Seemed like there were comers and goers and it wasn't a straightforward race for anybody. Who would ever believe though, at a short track, we would see 54 lead changes among 16 drivers. I know Joe Gibbs Racing, they led a lot of those laps, but that's a lot of lead changes, a record at a short track for NASCAR. Yeah, definitely a, a, a lot of comers and goers. Uh, tire strategies, tire questions about where the racetrack got to. Eventually, Denny Hammond put a day together that, that showed his dominance. Yeah, qualified third and led the most laps, but he had an eventful day. I don't, I don't think there's a driver that was out there that didn't have something happen throughout those 500 laps. Yeah, let's go back to stage one. Let's, let's show a little, uh, a little action here, but this is Denny kind of backing up a little bit. Had a tire go down. Fortunately for him, he happens here, touches the wall up there. Not a lot of damage there. Coincidentally, at the same time, Kyle Busch spins out on the other end of the racetrack, brings out the caution. And it was right about a lap or two away from the end of stage one, so that kind of saved everybody right there. There was a lot going on on that lap right there. Yeah, definitely was, but uh, eventually just that, that kind of kind of recovered his day. He had a couple other situations as the day went on. Uh, lap 182 comes to pit road, gets boxed in, but really a slow stop uh, beyond that as well. Let's take a look at that. Well, every time the caution came out, pretty much everybody was coming to pit road for four tires. So that put a lot of drivers on pit road, but you're gonna see right there, Justin Haley in the 51 car, he pulls in his pit box and he's got Denny Hamlin blocked in. So now Denny up, I'm blocked in, but you question the backing up part. Well, he backed up, but I almost think whether he lost it where he was in the gear and the sequential shifting or he stalled. You see Justin Haley left here and as we look, this car right here, that's Justin Haley, who was had him blocked in. There's five cars, it looks like, that come in between Haley and Denny Hamlin here by the time he gets to pit road exit. Part of it was being blocked in, but part of it was whatever stalled the car and not being able to go out once Haley had left the pit road. Hindsight, the 51 crew, they were already on the left side. Denny would have just been better to have hesitated a second and then just follow Haley off pit road. Yeah, definitely would have been the faster way for him and, and if he could have launched straight out at that point. But you're always trying to race your way forward. And you know on pit road, tenths of seconds are big deals. But this was a big hit for him. But that was not the last episode, I don't think, on pit road for Denny Hamlin because just at the end of stage number two, this is gonna be at lap 257, you're gonna see him coming into his pit box. It's gonna be a four tire stop, but I want you to watch the right front tire changer. When he puts the lug up there, look at him shaking his head. He does not like something that's going on right there. I'm gonna back that up right here and, and, and watch, him, watch him come. Watch the visor there. You see him shaking his head. That's definitely, there's something he didn't like. He's kind of paused everybody there, holds him down there. They get back around, but that's a that's about a three second penalty by the time you get done. 13.9 seconds, and we saw a lot of stops in the nine and 10 second range. Now the piece I'll say to this, we've pointed out two pit stops that were issues for him. Denny bragged on his pit crew post race. That's because the next three stops to finish the race were all sub 10 second stops. Down in the nine seconds, exactly. And coming off those pit stops in a position where he's got to make track position back up, Denny with a pretty impressive drive forward here. Yeah, it appeared his car was driving good. And we know he was pacing himself, but you can see him. He moved up to the second lane. He's able to turn down the bottom lane. He pretty much can do about whatever he wants to. And we saw this out of two or three guys that got themselves in deficits because the field wasn't running at 100%. They were running lap times to try to manage tires to be where they wanted to be. You could take the risk of, of being more aggressive and driving yourself forward. Denny got himself back in contention here, driving forward with it. And it just appeared 
His experience, plus everything he had learned up to this point of the race, was paying dividends right here. But you see the battle there with his teammate, Martin Trex Jr. in the 19 car. Martin gets the lead just for one lap with 17 to go. And it wasn't like they were on different agendas on tires because Denny had pitted with 52 to go. Martin Trex Jr. had pitted with 51 to go. Denny and Martin being the, the senior members of JGR, they brought that winning race speed all the way to the one-two finish. The other two Joe Gibbs drivers, Ty Gibbs and Christopher Bell had fast race cars. Ty Gibbs was really good in that 54 car, but I think they got a little greedy at the end. They had to make their green flag pit stop a little earlier than Denny and Martin, and I think they just used their stuff up. Still finished in the top 10, ninth and 10th, but not up there contending for the win. So the big topic of the weekend was tire wear and the fact that we just didn't see a rubber laid down on this racetrack. And I think this caught everybody off guard, Todd, because if you go back to Saturday's practice, the only thing that had been on the track was the truck series for some short practice and qualifying. So that track was still pretty green. And I watched Ross Chastain in the one car go out there and make a 49 lap run. And I think we saw some wear, but I don't think it was anything that was alarming. There were no big red flags out there. So this would remind me of the old Dover days. We'd go to Dover and the first pr practice we'd have on the racetrack, we'd run 12, 14 laps and see cords on tires. But we knew that the track would rubber in. I think a lot of teams probably thought the same things here that Bristol's always taken rubber come race time, but it didn't this time. But I mean, look at the differences right there. And this is 25 laps to go in both races. So we're kind of comparing apples to apples, but it looks like two completely different tracks. You look at how dark this area is, the bottom, where we had PJ1. That's nice and dark, but really the whole racetrack, all the way up the racetrack, we've got, we've got rubber laid. The only place that there's rubber on this side is up here in balls. Yeah, that's marbles. That's not even rubber. That's just marbles off the tires that's laying up there in that upper groove. There's things that make this happen. We go to Martinsville in the spring and the fall, and if it's cold at Martinsville, it won't take rubber and warm up and the bottom lane doesn't go away. Track temperature will affect this. You've done a little research on that. It was pretty close, but it wasn't quite as warm as it was last fall. Ambient temperature and track temperature very similar between the two races because if you go back to September, it was very cloudy, overcast. In fact, we had a little bit of a rain delay, so it was it was pretty close. I'm not going to say it was exact, but it was close. But you said, I think, and we talked about it, it's 10 degrees maybe, yeah, 10, no 10 more, degrees different. No more. I have seen that be a difference. I mean, there is a tipping point at which the track will take rubber. That may have been part of it. Probably the most obvious change was the fact we went away from the PJ1 and we went to resin this time. Yeah, and I think we need to check two other boxes. You know, the, the tire, obviously. Mm -hmm. Goodyear has said this is the same exact tire code that we raced there in September. In, in arrow and rules package, but it was the same arrow and rules package yesterday that we ran there in September, but that's the variable. Traction compound, which we've used for several years at Bristol, and the resin the first time this this past race weekend. And we listened to John Probst after the, after the race. He, talking to the media. He brought up all the reasons. And part of this was when they went and did the wet weather racing and, and testing here at Bristol. And when I looked at this last Tuesday, I felt like there was a chance of rain on yeah. Sunday. So uh, NASCAR wanted to come here with the wet weather tires because that's the quickest way to, to put the racetrack back in raceable condition. They tested that with the PJ1 and he said driving on that PJ1 when it was wet was like driving on oil. Yeah, I, even though I think we're a couple of days removed from this race this past Sunday, Todd, I, I think there's still a lot of people scratching their head, a lot of people confused. And I don't think they're just going to roll over and say, oh, we go back in September, we'll just go back with traction compound. I think they want to understand truly what went on this past weekend that we couldn't go no further than we were going on tires without wearing them out. Yeah, definitely one of those situations where you've got to understand it. This is a cutoff playoff race you want to make sure we're in a good position to put on good racing. Yeah, so we had, uh, besides Denny Hamlin and Martin Truex Jr., I'd like to say we had some winners and we had some losers yesterday. Uh, guys that performed well and finished well, guys that ran well, performed well, but didn't end up with not so good of a finish. Yeah, the first of them, I'll go back to it, this was, a, this was into the race, going a lap down in the last stage, Kyle Larson here really struggling with it. 
Yeah, he was running 20th, and you can see right there, Denny Hamlin and Martin Trex Jr. just absolutely drove by him and put him a lap down. I wondered if Cliff actually waited till they were in a lucky dog position, now a lap down if they came to pit road and, and just to get ahead of the whole situation. But as we looked at this pit stop, might have been a little more to come into pit road there. Yeah, because I think he definitely had some tire issues and he had run 55 laps and we still had 66 laps to go as they're making this green flag pit stop right here. And one thing before we get to this, I want to bring it back. Kyle Larson, we talked about Denny Hamlin, you know, was able to drive back from his penalty and get there. Kyle Larson got a penalty, pit road penalty on this last stage two caution that put him in the back. He had to use his stuff up driving forward and it showed here uh, as he comes to pit road 434 here, this is going to go ahead and, uh, yeah, as you look at that. That is the right front tire. That is the rubber is gone. It is down to the canvas right there on the right front tire. Definitely, and, and as you go forward from here, right front was missing, but let's take a look at this right rear as well. Oh, we're not done yet. Look at that right rear tire. It's about as bad are worse than maybe the right front was. So there obviously is a reason that five car came to pit road. Both right side tires wore out. And the crazy part to me is that this is with what, 66 laps to go? He's gotta run further than he just ran. <laughs> That's gotta make his a crew chief a little nervous. If you look at it though, he, he pulled back out with these tires on, a uh, pretty impressive run that he put forward from here. Well, he was one of the earlier ones to pit. There's still a lot of drivers that has not made their green flag stops, and he knows he's got to make hay with these four fresh Goodyear tires, even though he doesn't want to overwork them. Yeah, and, and you can see Christopher Bell sideways on the old tires here, but watch this drive. This is just what how much the tires have given up and where guys were at. Keep in mind that this pit cycle didn't end for another 16, 17 laps. Excuse me, coming through, coming through, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty impressive run. And really the piece to, that got me was when I looked at his lap times at the end of the race, he still was able to run 1670. Somehow he, he tore through the field like this and still had enough rubber left on the tire at the end to come out with a top five finish. Yeah, I think he knew he had a good race car, but Cliff Daniels was on him about pacing himself, but he was not the only Hendrick car that prevailed. Alex Bowman getting a top five finish, and we talked about those green flag pit stops. Blake Harris ran him all the way to 48 laps to go. They had run 73 laps on his tires. I didn't think that was even possible. So the flip-flop of the strategy here, he, he wasn't the first to come, he was the last to come. They got to the point that they, they stayed out with Martin and, uh, and Denny until both of those guys came, came the lap after them, but they didn't have to worry about tires. They'd run 70 some laps. They had what, 48 to go? 48 to go. Um, they could just be aggressive coming forward. Again, drove their way up to a top five finish. And that's two of the guys that we saw that kind of capitalized on this last cycle. Uh, there were a couple that lost on it. Uh, probably the first one I want to get to, Eric Jones. What a tough, tough situation for him. Here's his pit stop. This is the last green flag pit stop, but had an issue. Yeah, I talked to his crew chief, Dave Ellens. They had a tire coming apart. He missed pit road, and then you saw right there, look how close he is pitted to the pit wall. Here, I'll back that back up so you can take a look at that. Yeah, I mean, he just basically slid through his pits all the way against the wall, and what this ended up resulting, you can see there the guys can't even work on the left side of the car. They're going to have to back him up right there. This ended up a 17-8 pit stop. Eric, this 43 car, they were flirting with a top 10 finish, and this kind of took it away. Yeah, they were, and if you look at it, this 43 car, he's, he's sitting there right around 10th, 11th, 12th, uh, you know, was there right, right along the day. And, and actually, just before the cycle happened there of pit stops, he was running 12th here, if you, if you look at it. He's sitting there 12th, had a day that I think was going to give net them around a 10th place finish. That pit stop buried him back and uh, ended up netting out at a 20th place finish. Yeah, not, not the day they were looking for. But then one of those Joe Gibbs drivers that we had talked about earlier, Ty Gibbs in that 54 car, they had a disaster in practice on Saturday. He could not even make a lap in that 54 car, but when they dropped the green flag, he started making his way to the front. Next thing you know, he's up there leading laps. Yeah, yeah, really put together. I, I thought the first two thirds of the race, he was the car to beat. I thought he was the best of the Joe Gibbs cars, but uh, had a couple issues here. As you look at the line graph, you see him right up top. He, he's right up here leading the race. Um, did have a situation in this area, and we'll get a little deeper into that. Yeah, he had led from lap 399 to lap 425, 75 laps to go. 
but something is starting to go amiss here. One, he's getting in some lap traffic, but you see, that's a pass for the lead. Denny Hamlin, his teammate in 11, Martin Trex Jr., goes by him, so I think Ty knows he's got something going and you on. You saw him hit the wall there as he tried to maneuver around Ty, Todd Gill in there, but uh, it's, it's kind of backing up. You see, there's the first guy on tires. Uh, Josh Berry had just come to pit road. I think he pitted at 427. Uh, just driving off the of tires. Yeah, more and more drivers are, are getting by Ty. I think Ty knows he's in trouble, but he's trying to keep from making that green flag pit stop in, in case that caution comes out. All day long, we've just, as long as you can keep running, somebody's going to be a factor. You're hoping it's somebody else be, and you can get to pit road. It's like playing a game of chicken. <laughs> it, it is, and, and we kind of go forward from there. Uh, here's lap 443, and, and this is the unraveling of his day. Yeah, you're going to see him go down in the corner. And up the racetrack he goes. The, the tire right blown. rear tire is absolutely gone. And one of the things I want to point out, this this orange box right here, that's his pit road. So he's going to have to make a whole nother lap. He can't get to the pit road there um, to, to get down and get tires. Yeah, he's pitting on the back stretch. And remember, we had broke it down. Under green, you can enter and exit on your pit road. You don't have to run the entire pit road. So he's still got to get all the way back around to get to his pit road, which is on the back stretch. You see him going down the front stretch here. Just can't can't get the pit road. Yeah, it's a it's a tough situation for a, a young guy who I thought of the four JGR cars probably had the most pace. And had the worst car on Saturday. <laughs> the worst car of everybody, not just a Joe Gibbs. Finally gets to his pit box. He's going to get those four tires and get back out there. But he's got a lot of ground to make up. Yeah, as you look at that right rear, it's completely unraveled and, and all the errors come out of it. Uh, a tough day for them. Rick, a great when you can say your tough day ended up with a top 10 finish. When you see him hit the wall there with a little over 50 laps to go, can't get to pit road, you go, there is no way he's going to finish inside the top 10. But I think that shows how good of a car he had. Came back to finish ninth. Well, Todd, we're going to leave concrete. We're going to leave resin up in Bristol. Race number six, our first road course race of 2024. Circuit of the Americas turning left and right. This will be our fourth time to go there, and every time we've went there, there's been something different. What's going to be different this time? The one piece that's changed, it was calamity. As you looked at, this is the restart from last year, and the restart zone is about halfway up the front straightaway. Let's go ahead and hit play here. Uh, this was a talk of, of, you know, point of emphasis. Last year, after this race, they actually made some changes going to Indianapolis, but as you watch this restart, everybody on the front stretch, they can take advantage of this in this turn one uphill braking zone. It's a, it's chaos. They're off the racetrack and they hadn't even got to turn one. They're eight, nine, ten wide. We had multiple restarts because of this. So what NASCAR has done is they've moved the restart zone. If the drivers won't fix it, NASCAR has to fix it. Yes, so they've moved the restart zone all the way back to just exiting turn 20. This should actually get the field where it's coming around the corner, yes. not taking advantage of stacking up in the runs they can make. When you go back and look at that first video here, Larry, you can mark up where the, uh, where the restart zone is here. They're just about getting to it right now. They're right there. And to your point, now they're basically going to be, they're going to be separated when they get to the restart zone. There's still going to be drivers that's back in turn 20, not even in turn 20 just yet. And last year at Indianapolis, after we got to Coda, they implemented some of this. And let's take a look at that. Here's a, the restarts from two years ago at, at Indianapolis. Chaos here. Everybody kind of gathering up. As you can see, the guys back here in the back, um, all these guys, they're actually closing the gap, getting a run on these guys, uh, on the leaders, and it leads to chaos in turn one. Well, there you see almost the same thing as Coda. We're just going to be going a different direction here in turn one, but they're just going to be stacked up. And so, once again, NASCAR said drivers won't fix it. We'll do something to fix it ourselves. Five, six wide, and it ends up with just carnage as we get there. Uh, Let's go forward and take a look at what NASCAR has done now. They've come to a point, they moved the restart zone back in Indianapolis into the S's before the last corner. Uh, that actually puts them in a situation where now, when NASCAR did this, you could change lanes whenever you wanted to. They weren't going to make you go all the way to the start finish line. Put you through the corner, much more organized coming to the front, front stretch and to turn one. It creates less chaos. They're separated and they haven't even got to the flag stand just yet. A lot more organized and you saw it back there. There were cars that were not even through the corner 
when the leaders got to the restart. Now we've not taken all the racing away. We've still got two and three wide, but we don't have eight wide getting to turn one, and that's what they're hoping. They're to racing accomplish. here. They're not wrecking. That's that's a good that's a good point. You talked about the restarts here, but stage breaks coming back. What will that do to strategies? Well, I've asked a lot of crew chiefs and they said, you know, whether you like it or don't like it, it depends on what pair of shoes you're wearing on a particular day. Uh, if you're not in a position to score stage points, uh, you're going to flip the stages. You're going to pit before that caution ends. But what we've seen, Todd, with the way the competition is, if you want to win the race, and this is a 75 lap race. If you want to win the race, you probably are going to have to forego getting those stage points or trying to get that stage win to put yourself in position for that final stage track position. But it does bring options back Absolutely. to the crew chief's hands. Another piece are going to, these crew chiefs are going to have to face here. We've repaved part of this racetrack. Yeah, and this is something that I think they did for some of the other series, but it's definitely going to affect. They have repaved here through turns three, two and three. They repaved through nine, 10, and 11. That comes on that long back straightaway. They repaved turn 12 at the end of that straightaway. The breaking zone. Heavy breaking zone. And then a couple of the final turns, 18 and 19. All of that has new, fresh asphalt. So if we look at this now, we've gotten done with the overhead. Here's the asphalt and exiting two into turn three. I really don't see that being a big change for the guys, just to add some grip. Think about grip on this fresh asphalt. When you leave it, the grip's going to go completely away and probably a little bit of tire wear. We saw this at Darlington when they did a patch up there. Yes. Exiting the grip was where you saw issues happen. Uh, the second piece here, 9, 10, and 11. This is a pretty important corner leading up to the, long, the back, back straightaway. How you get off turn 11, it's going to dictate your speed all the way down that long back straightaway, the longest straightaway aside from the front stretch. So you've got that grip, and then you, you leave turn 11, and all of a sudden you're back to old asphalt again. In this case, the, the exit, you know, you've got enough asphalt there. You get straight before you get there. Probably one of the places that I always felt like was a challenge here this area into 12, it was really rough for a tough, for a very high braking zone. Which is probably one reason they put the fresh asphalt down and resurfaced it for the other series, because there's a lot of different series that race at Circuit of the Americas, including the Formula One. Yeah, and in a tight corner there of turn 12 uh, coming forward, kind of enters the inner loop part of the racetrack. And, this is another one, you're gonna grip up on exit. You're hard to get pressed to get full throttle through this area anyhow, because it's a constant radius, it's a constant turn, but once you get to the exit of turn 19, all of a sudden you've left that fresh asphalt and you're back to the old asphalt again. I wouldn't be surprised to see the, the arc of this corner change to be just up on the edge of the asphalt, use up all the speed because you know you're gonna grip, grip up when you get there. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, Todd, we go to tracks where the surfaces wore out, like North Wilkesboro last year for the All-Star Race. We go to tracks that have brand new surfaces, like North Wilkesboro this year will be. But this track, it has both in one lap. So it's going to be a challenge for the drivers and a challenge for the crew chiefs. But you know what? It's going to be fun. You want to watch our first road course race of 2024 this Sunday on Fox, 3.30 Eastern Time.